How's it going everybody? Today we're looking at how to dim a mean well driver from Home Assistant for about 10 bucks in parts using an ESP32 and an optocoupler. Being able to control your light intensity is a great feature to add to your automated garden. You can manually adjust your lights using a fader as required or automatically ramp your lights up and down at the beginning and end of each day or adjust the strength of different channels of different colors throughout the day to create your own light recipes. For example, you might want to make the middle of your light cycle very blue and then take the blues down and bump the reds up at the end of your light cycle before lights out. Before we get going, a big thank you to everybody who donated since the last video, so shout out to N27, Ken, Nanny Nanny, M. Kozik 1, and Thomas. I really appreciate it and it helps me to keep this thing going. In this video, we'll be covering how to control dimming on the most popular brand of LED grow light drivers, which is Meanwell. If you have a different type of driver, in order for this method to work, it'll need to have a dedicated dimming circuit that is controllable by PWM and source its own current on that dimmer circuit. The parts we'll need for this are an ESP32 microcontroller on a breadboard, some DuPont jumper cables, a PC817 optocoupler, a 100 ohm resistor, some Wagos or whatever you've got kicking around to splice cables together with, and some 18 gauge wire to go between our breadboard and our LED driver. I'll be working with two drivers in this video, a Meanwell HLG 240HC 2100B and a Meanwell XLG 240AB, and both of these things are going to be driving some quantum boards from Horticulture Lighting Group. You'll notice that both of these drivers have the letter B in their part name. The B means that the driver has something called 3-in-1 dimming built into it, 3-in-1 dimming means that the driver can be dimmed using resistance, which would be done using a potentiometer, probably the most popular method with these things, or by supplying 1 to 10 volts or 0 to 10 volts DC, depending on the driver, or by supplying a PWM signal, which is what we're going to be using. If your meanwhile driver has an A at the end of it, that means it has internal dimming built in that's controlled using a little potentiometer screw that's hidden beneath a plug like this one. A-type drivers will not work for this, it has to be B-type with 3-in-1 dimming. PWM stands for Pulse Width Modulation, and essentially PWM is a way to reduce the average power delivered by an electrical signal by turning it on and off very quickly. That's about as deep as we'll go into explaining PWM here, so you can read up on it if you're looking for a better understanding, but it won't really be necessary to accomplish our goal today because I'll tell you exactly what you need to do. One thing worth mentioning is that not all meanwhile drivers will dim all the way down to zero or completely off. To find out, you can check the datasheet for your driver. If it specifies 1 to 10 volt dimming in the dimming section, that means it will not turn all the way off and you'll need to control an outlet or a relay or something if you want to be able to shut your light all the way off. If it says 0 to 10 volt dimming in the datasheet, that means that you will be able to shut it right off. And most of the larger HLG drivers, like the 320, 480 and 600H are 0 to 10 volt, but the smaller ones tend to be 1 to 10 volt. If you have a 1 to 10 volt driver like this 240H I have, Meanwell does not specify what happens when you go below 10k ohms resistance, or below 1 volt, or below 10% duty cycle depending on which method you're using to dim, so you may want to keep your minimum dim to 10% or higher. I personally have never had any issues going below 10% or even to a dead short between the dimming leads, but I figured I should point this out anyway just as a little disclaimer. Okay, let's get to it. We'll start by setting this up in Home Assistant and then move on to the physical install. I'm going to be using an ESP32 that I already set up in Part 5, which covered temperature and humidity. This ESP32 has already been flashed and is being used to pull climate data from three Ruby tags over Bluetooth. Since it's already been flashed, we won't need to plug it in to update it with our new code, and we can just do it over the air. If you're starting with a brand new ESP32 with nothing on it, then you can check out part 4 or part 5 to see how to do the initial setup of an ESP32 using a micro USB cable. Alright, I'm going to go into the ESP Home add-on that we configured in part 3 and edit my existing Ruby node which again uses an ESP32 and not a Node MCU. If you're using a Node MCU, this can still be done, but the setup looks a little bit different. I'll scroll down to the bottom below all my Ruby stuff, and I'm going to paste in this code that I've already prepared and tested. So first, I'm setting up an output, and the platform is LEDC, which is where we're going to configure our PWM parameters. We'll set this up on GPIO pin 23, our frequency is going to be 1220 Hz in this case, and I'm going to invert this output, otherwise our dimming would be backwards, where you'd go to turn your light up to 100% and it would shut off. 
I'll give it an ID in all lowercase with no spaces called grow light underscore PWM and assign it to PWM channel zero. If you have multiple outputs set up, you should know that the channels are linked in pairs, so you can't assign a frequency of say 1220 hertz to channel zero and 5000 hertz to channel one. Both channel zero and one will have the same 1220 hertz frequency, and if you want to use a different frequency, you're going to need to move it to an even numbered channel like two or four. I had to do this in my system because I have an output for my grow light and an output for my exhaust fan, and the exhaust fan is set up at a different frequency, so I had to set it to channel 2. Okay, now we're also going to define a light component here and tie it to the output that we just set up. So the platform for this light component will be monochromatic because it's just a single color, it's not an RGB or anything with different channels. The name will be grow light, and the output will be the ID that we defined above, which is grow light PWM. Now if we just compiled and pushed this as is, it would work, but you'd notice that the dimming range seemed a little bit odd, where it might max out at halfway or not do anything for the first quarter or something like that. And to fix this, we have to add this gamma underscore correct line and set it to 1.0. It defaults to 2.8, which causes some weirdness with the stuff us gardeners are working with with these uh, LED drivers. Everything looks good now, so I'll upload this to the ESP32 over the air. Okay, good to go, and now I'm also going to add a light card to my dashboard so I can manually control the dimming. Good stuff. Now, we have some work in Node-RED to do, but I think it might actually be smarter to set up the hardware and then come back to Node-RED just so we have something to test with. So let's do the hardware setup now. The VIP component in this scenario is our optocoupler. And let me preface this all by saying that this actually isn't my solution. I found this on the Arduino forums where somebody had asked the same question, how do I dim a meanwhile driver? And a user by the name of Wawa suggested using a PC817 optocoupler and it works great. So shout out to Wawa. So an optocoupler is a really good way to electrically isolate circuits because there's no electrical connection between its input and its output sides. On the input side, there's a little LED in here that emits infrared light when we power the input pins of the optocoupler. And on the other side of it, there's a photosensitive device that detects this infrared light and opens and closes the connection between its two output pins. So when the IR LED turns on, the two output pins connect to one another, and when the LED turns off, the two output pins are separated from one another. So what we're going to do is use a PWM output from our ESP32 to power this IR LED on and off super quickly, 1220 times per second exactly. And we're going to hook up our driver dim positive and dim negative to the output side of the optocoupler. So really what this boils down to is the fact that we'll be shorting the dimming wires from the driver together 1220 times per second. When we move our little dimming slider in Home Assistant, what's really happening is we're adjusting what's called the duty cycle of our PWM signal, which changes the ratio of time that our PWM signal is high versus low per period or per on and off cycle. And this will tell the driver to change the intensity of the light. Again, Google PWM frequency and duty cycle if you want to know more. What we'll do first is plop our optocoupler down on the breadboard and make sure it spans across the middle of the board just like this, with the little circular dot in the bottom left corner. This dot marks the anode of the IR LED, so place yours just like mine. We don't want any of the four pins to have continuity with each other. When you span it across the board like this, each pin gets its own lane on the board and nothing is shorted together. Don't put it like this or like this. Next, we're going to take the ground pin on the ESP32 and put it on this blue rail on the side of the breadboard. And this is just to make it easier to tie stuff to ground since all these pins along the blue strip are connected. We'll then tie the cathode of the IR LED, which is this pin right here, to the ground rail. Next, we need to tie the anode of the IR LED to the PWM pin that we set up, which is on GPIO 23. If we just went straight to the PWM pin, we'd blow up the LED inside our optocoupler because our PWM voltage from the ESP32 will get up to 3.3 volts. And this will cause too much current to flow through the IR LED, so we need to add a resistor in series to limit current. Here's how you do the math to figure out what resistance you need. First, we'll check the datasheet of our optocoupler. 
It looks like it's rated for a max of 50 milliamps of current and has a typical voltage drop or forward voltage of 1.2 volts. We don't want to run this thing at max current, so I'm going to shoot for 20 milliamps, which is about half of the max rating and well within the capabilities of the ESP32 pin to supply. We use Ohm's law from here to calculate our resistor value. We know our PWM circuit will have a max of 3.3 volts, and we will subtract the voltage drop of the optocoupler from this, which is 1.2 volts, and we're left with 2.1 volts. We want 20 milliamps of current to flow, so Ohm's law tells us that voltage in volts divided by current in amps equals resistance in ohms. 2.1 volts divided by 20 milliamps, which is 0.02 amps, it's important to do that conversion, is equal to a resistance of 105 ohms. So in this case, a 100 ohm resistor will work just great. I'm just going to clip the legs on this resistor to make it a little bit more manageable, and then I'm going to use it to connect right from pin 23 to the anode of the optocoupler. For this step, you have to be absolutely sure that you're working with the dimming circuit of the driver and not the output circuit that actually powers the lights. In some cases, the conductors might be the same color, like on my HLG240H, the dimmer wires are brown and blue, and the output wires are also brown and blue, and the only thing that identifies the dimmers are these little black and grey bands on them. So again, be sure you've got the right pair of wires because you do not want to short the output wires on your driver. I'm using 18 gauge solid core wire and I'm going to use my Wago connectors now to tie my 18 gauge solid core wires to my dimming leads on the driver. When you plug these into the breadboard, it really doesn't matter which wire goes to which side of the optocoupler output. You could reverse them and they'd work just the same. Now let's test this with the light card that we put on our dashboard earlier, and for those of you who are really paying attention, you might notice that the dashboard I'm using looks a little bit different. That's just because it's from my own personal system, not the test system, but it's the exact same code. So, as expected, my HLG240H does not dim all the way to off, but if I switch over to the XLG240AB, it does in fact dim to off. Let me give you a really basic example of how you could implement dimming into an automation. What we'll do is create a schedule for our light and have it slowly ramp up to 100% brightness when it hits the scheduled on time, and then slowly ramp down to 0% when it hits the off time. Let's hop into Node Red. First we'll start a new flow called Lights. The first node I'll use is Big Timer. And this will handle my light scheduling. I'm going to pick my lights on and lights off time from the drop downs here. I'll set mine for an on time of 8 a.m. and an off time of 8 p.m. If you wanted to schedule something with more granularity and the times in the drop down didn't work for you, like say if I wanted this to be from 7.55 to 8 o'clock, you can adjust the offset in minutes in the offset boxes. If I wanted 7.55, I could pick 8 o'clock and then do a minus 5 minute offset. I'm going to set a very basic on message of on, all lowercase, and an off message of off. One more thing to do is to scroll down to the bottom here and uncheck this box that says repeat. We don't want the big timer to send the same on message every minute or off message every minute. We just want it to send it the one time when the time hits. Otherwise we'd be telling that light to transition over the half hour period every single time we sent the message, which would be no good. So make sure this is unchecked. The first output at the top of this block is the one we want, since it's the one that fires your on and off message at the times that you pick. Since we have just one output that's going to handle both on and off functionality, I'll wire it to a switch node so I can differentiate between the two commands. So in this switch node, I'll set it up so if the incoming message.payload equals the string on, which I programmed in BigTimer, we'll forward the message out output 1, and I'll add another output saying that if the incoming message.payload equals the string off, send the message out output 2. Now I'm going to add two change nodes and wire them to one call service node. The call service node is going to be set up for the light domain. The service is going to be light.turnon, and the entity is going to be the one that we created in ESP Home, which is called light.growlight. Okay, now we put the magic in the change nodes here. 
So right now the payload coming into the change node is just going to be the word on for the top one and off for the bottom one. We're using change nodes here because rather than just pass the on and off messages to the call service node, we actually want to set some attributes that are going to change how the call service node works. Let's go into the first one here and I'm going to set it up so it changes our message payload to something called a JSON object. I'll hit the dots to open up the window nice and wide and I'm just going to paste some code in. Don't worry, I'll provide a link in the video description so you can import this flow so you don't have to type any of this out. So there's two attributes here that we're going to pass to the call service node from these change nodes. Brightness percentage and transition time in seconds. Brightness percentage will tell the call service node, hey, when you turn this light on, set it to X percent brightness. The transition value determines how long it takes to get to this new brightness state. So if I want this light to turn on to eventually get to 100% brightness, but I want it to slowly ramp up to that point over 30 minutes, I'll set my brightness underscore PCT to 100 and my transition to 1800. And remember this value is in seconds, so 1800 seconds is 30 minutes. Now we'll go to our bottom change node and paste this in again. And this time we're going to set our brightness percentage to zero and we'll leave the transition time the same. This is going to be what turns our light off. A couple things to note here. You can't use a light.turn off as your call service if you're setting the brightness percentage and transition. So you actually have to use a light.turn on, but you're going to be telling it to turn on at 0% brightness, which turns it off. So that's why we only have the one call service node and not two, one for on and one for off. Second thing to note is that this is only going to work on my XLG240AB light because it will dim all the way to off. If I wanted my HLG240H light to turn off, I'd have to do a transition time to dim it all the way down to 10% or whatever, and then have the light plugged into a smart plug outlet or a relay or something that I would also shut off at the end of the transition time. The last thing I'm going to do is wire up a couple injection nodes and this is just to make my testing easier so I don't have to mess around with big timer and wait for it to actually trigger things. The first injection node will inject a string and it's going to be set to on, all lowercase just like we configured in big timer, and the second will inject the string off. Once I deploy this and it comes back up, I can click these little buttons on the left side of these inject nodes to send the messages whenever I want and verify that everything is working. One last thing, if you're noticing that the node red timestamps are wrong when you actually deploy and you can see the timestamps under the nodes as things happen, make sure that your time zone is actually set in Home Assistant. So go to your configuration, then general. And if you do have to change your time zone, do a full device reboot afterwards by going into Supervisor, then System, and hit Reboot Host. Just restarting the Home Assistant program through something like Server Controls might not work. That'll do it for this one, everybody. Thank you, as always, for watching. Check out the video description for all the relevant links, and please do me a solid and subscribe to the channel if you want to see more content like this, and we'll see you on the next one.